Uh, the text says this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked, when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Jew and Greek, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. From the uh, text last week, I was sort of pitched you the idea that in a, an emergency, you have to focus in on the most important things. Otherwise, you wind up sort of just getting rolled by the circumstances that are boiling around you. And hopefully I don't have to tell you, but maybe I do, um, the church is in a state of emergency in our present world. That may not feel like it sometimes, or maybe it does feel like it sometimes, but Jesus told us that this world is, is going to always be hostile on some level or another to the true witness of the church. And I was trying to remind you last week that the true witness of the church is not a list of things you should do and a list of things you should not do. That's not what this passage is telling us. It is telling us that our, our primary identity, our primary witness is that we have already died. We're already dead. And we've already been raised to new life with Jesus Christ. That is true. And so regardless of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we ought to be radically different people from the world. Why? Because the world, they, they, they are dead, but they don't know it. So what they do is they gather up all of the things that they can in their life to make themselves feel better, to try to protect themselves, to, to try to gain some sort of worldly advantage because this world is all they have. And so, like, it shouldn't be shocking to the church when the world is lost in sexual immorality, when it's forever chasing its tail with, with materialism because it's trying to satisfy the one thing that every human heart longs for. Completion. We, as Christians, are people who are complete. And so, especially in a time of disaster, in a time when everything's going wrong, the church is supposed to be a witness. Like, everybody should be able to look at the church and go, wow, these people are acting differently. They're not running around with their hair on fire. What's going on there? And of course, if that is true, that that, that that is what the church is for, the church is for demonstrating the truth that we are already dead and already made alive again. And so it, it may look like um, I'm poor. It may look like I'm sick. It may look like I'm persecuted. It may look like I'm abused, like I'm a nobody. I'm not going anywhere. But the truth is, I am already raised to new life, and I am already seated 
anytime I want to in the highest heaven with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That should change the way that we operate in the world because we're totally and completely full. We're complete. We don't need anything else. The world's always looking for that next thing, that thing that might satisfy, but not the church. So, of course, if you think about that truth in sort of a strategic way, like if the world were a force and the church were a force and they were um, in a war over what is actually true, what the world needs to do, it only has to do one thing in order to win. And that is get the church to act in hypocrisy. That's all, that's all that the world has to do. All evil has to do. All Satan has to do is just get the church to act like the world, even for a short season, and its witness will be lost. Because then, when people who are, who are lost in the world and they're thinking to themselves, gosh, there's got to be something more than this. You know what? I, I remember hearing that the church is different, that, that, that Christians are different, and I'm so desperate for an answer, I'm going to go. I'm going to risk being made fun of or whatever it is. I'm going to go to a church and I'm going to check it out and see, do they have a different answer? And if the conclusion that they come to is, no, they don't. They're, they're doing the same thing that all the hedonists are doing, trying to make themselves feel better, but instead of by participating in passion and lust and obscene talk and, and immorality, they do it by just pretending they're better than everybody else. And that's how they fill their tank. Oh, I'm better than you. Oh, I'm better than you. Oh, I'm more righteous than you. But in the end, they're just doing the same thing. And I am telling you that that is what's happening in our churches right now. We are being tempted to display hypocrisy so that the light of the world will actually be darkness. And Jesus said, if, if, if what is coming out of you, the windows of your soul is darkness, if your light is darkness, how dark is that darkness? So, last week, I was talking about all of the things that Paul says, put these things to death. Put these things to death. Put off these things. Because that's the way the world works. But, but that's not the way the church works. Or it shouldn't be. And so, and so we have to act in such a way that people will believe we've already died and we're already resurrected that we are already right now seated with Christ. How do we do that? Well, Paul's clear. You do it by controlling your thoughts. This may sound crazy, but this is what Scripture teaches explicitly here in Colossians 3. If then you've been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above. Set your mind on the things that are above. This may sound crazy, but the practical application is right here in the second verse of this chapter. You, you do it by controlling your thoughts. Okay. So, <laughs> when I was an immature Christian, my closeness with God was sort of dictated by the topography of life's circumstances. In that, when things were going well, it was like I was on top of a mountain. And God seemed really close. 
Has anybody had that experience before? You just, you feel like your spiritual life is on a roll. Your regular life is on a roll. Things are happening for you. It's like, yes, me and Jesus are jiving. We're making things happen. I'm headed in the right direction. I'm on the mountaintop. I'm near God. He's answering my prayers. I can like, like, yes, this feels so great. But then what happens is that as we continue along life's path, the circumstances change. And the mountaintop um, devolves and there's like a, a cliff face. And me being unable to sort of see it, I walk right off the cliff and, and, and smack myself in the ground way, way further down. Everything's going wrong. God, what's going on? Why aren't you answering my prayers anymore? Why are I want to get back on that mountain. You know, I want to I want to get back to the place where you and I are just jiving, where things are going great. I love my job. I'm getting paid far more than I'm worth. I don't work that many hours. Everybody likes me. Uh, I have the most amazing parties. They're, whatever the things are, those circumstances in life, and, and for each person, those circumstances are going to be different. One person's going to care a lot about how much money they're making, and that won't mean a hill of beans to the next person. The next person will care much more about social standing or whatever it is. But my argument is, all of those things are life circumstances. Now, what we have to do, what Paul is telling us to do, is quit walking around on the earth. Christians don't walk around. They fly. They fly. They find themselves rising above life's circumstances. And no matter what the topography is doing as you're going, you think airplanes like care a lot when they're flying over the ocean versus flying over the mountains? They don't care. They're above them all. That's the way we're supposed to be. Now, for me, this makes a lot of sense because ever since I was a little kid, Every once in a while, I get one of these dreams where I'm flying. I'm not sure if you guys have had those dreams. It's crazy. But something happens in my dream. Something scary is going on, and I jump. But my jump, like, takes me way, way up. And all of a sudden, I find myself in, in the air, and I'm flying around. The rest of the dream, I'm having a great time, just soaring around the sky. And I, I think that Paul's basically saying right here, in a way, if you will, um, you have to stop having your spiritual life and your relationship with God dictated by life circumstances. You're going to have to learn this is just Christian maturity. And it's sort of like all of Christian maturity in one lesson. You've got to float above that stuff. Put your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are all around you. So, How do we do that? Well, the first thing is you've got to start taking stuff off. You have to start taking stuff off. And in my metaphor, these would be like chains and weights and things like that. You have to take them off. And, um, and, and like in verse 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Then he, he lists out these things. In verse 8, he says, uh, but now you must put them all away. Put it off. Put it away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. These are the things that like the world does in order to try to artificially elevate themselves. They elevate themselves by tearing other people down. That's not what Christians do. Christians don't need to do that because we don't compare ourselves with other people. We have our mind on Christ. That's who we're always comparing ourselves to. Now, in a way, you always like are falling short of Christ, but it's sort of like falling short of the highest star in the sky. Even though you're falling short of it, you're still way, way, way up. It's possible. So you have to put off all of the old self and all of the old self's practices. And then in verse 10... Paul will tell us what to put on, what to do. He says, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. This is a wonderful gift because, because Paul is not saying, hey, 
you need to police up all of your actions. You need to create an emotional state of being that is sort of like, like always positive. That's not what, he's not telling us to do anything like that. He's saying, it's with your mind. Use your mind. Use your knowledge. Use your mind to be, like, renew your knowledge of the image of the creator. And, and in that environment, when, when we are sort of getting up off the ground by keeping our minds on Christ, thinking about the Jesus things, caring about what Jesus cares about, then you will find that here, in this place, where we have our minds set on God, we don't care so much about why you and me are different. That's the world's way. The narcissism of small differences. Like we're always different than the other people. There's always an in-group and an out-group. But that's not the way the church operates. No, Christ is all, and he's in all. So, let me suggest to you that we have a way, if I might read the rest of this text, these five verses, as sort of a blueprint for how you fly. Okay, so, so these are like, like strapping a bunch of helium balloons uh, to your belt. This is how you do it. This is how you get up off the ground. Uh, verse 12. Put on then. Put something on. So we had to put things off. Now we have to put something on. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. And this is the very first point. When you're putting something on, our focus is on who we are, an identity that we receive in God. He doesn't tell you what to do with your thoughts first. He just says like, hey, start imagining, start imagining that you've been chosen by God. Like pretend that's real. Pretend that God actually chose you, that he loved you. That actually... You don't have to pretend. That's actually true. Sometimes you have to, it feels like you have to pretend, right? Because you think like, how could God choose me? What makes me special? I'm no better than anybody. And I promise you, I am no better than you are, really and truly. And you're no better than me. That's not why God chose us, because we're better than one another. He chose us because he loves us. Start putting that into your brain, into your, into your thoughts. That you are chosen. That you are holy. That you are different. That you are set apart. That's what holy means. Not a common thing, a special thing, a dedicated thing, a thing that is sacred. That's who you are. And you are beloved. That God loves you. This we must put on that we are God's chosen, that we are holy, and that we are beloved. Now, you may be saying to yourself right now, wait, 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 I've heard this sermon before. I've tried this before. And yes, it works for a time. I get to floating. But, but something happens as I am like floating and going, oh, God, we're so close. You love me. I love you. You know, uh, uh, you, you chose me. Uh, you, you, you've set me up. You paid for all of my sin with, with the Lord Jesus' blood. You've, you've called me apart. I love. And then there's some dumb dumb up there with a hot poker popping the balloons. I'm like, hey, don't pop my balloon, man. And he's like, you suck. Pop. And I don't know what to do about that. And he goes like, you're good for nothing. Pop. And, and other people start popping my balloons. What am I supposed to do about that? Sooner, I, then all of a sudden, I start coming out of the, of the sky. I smack myself on the ground. I get up, and I get a club, and I go after that person. How dare you pop my balloons? Whap, whap, whap. You suck. You're bad. Nobody likes you. And that's the problem. That's the problem, Paul. The problem is not me. It's other 
idiots around me who are always popping my spiritual balloons that are supposed to get me up into the sky. Anyway, I, I got to take some knives or a BB gun or something so when other people are coming around me with their little hot pokers, I can shoot them down first. Well, okay. Yes, that's true. Other people will come up and try to pop your balloon especially people who don't feel very chosen, people who don't feel very loved, people who don't feel very holy. And they hate it when other people feel that way. And so, yes, they come along with their sharp sticks and try popping everybody's balloon. When that happens to you, not if, but when, when someone who's feeling nasty comes up and wants to pop your balloon, Paul's going to give you some practical choices to make on how you deal with that person. This is one of the things you're putting on. I'm just going to continue reading. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Compassionate hearts. And actually, um, the reason it says compassionate hearts is because the actual mechanical translation is actually the spleen, like your guts. The, the Greeks believed that deep down in your guts was where the strongest emotions that you feel come out of. And these are typically like an ultra-pure rage or an ultra-pure like, like compassion. The kind When you see someone else and you're actually feeling what they're feeling and it hurts you so bad way down deep inside, when somebody else is really hurting and all of a sudden you start hurting, our world, our world calls that empathy, but the Bible calls it a compassionate heart. You have that option. When someone's coming up to pop your spiritual balloon and take you out of the sky, you can respond just by being compassionate. You can also respond in kindness. And most of these in this list are the exact same words that Paul uses when describing the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Kindness. That's a fruit of the Spirit. Humility, which is lowliness. And you know what? Whenever you respond humbly, that person just cannot get at your balloon. An old friend of mine said, the best thing about humility is you can't beat humble. And he meant that if you're down on the ground, the person, you know, they want you to stand up so they can start swinging at you. But if you're laying down on the ground, they, they, they can't get to you. You're already down. You can't beat humble. You know what? You Christians are all alike. You suck. You goody two-shoes. You know what? Actually, I don't think you understand how true the thing you're saying is. We can be totally, I can be the most inconsiderate person in the world. The Lord's still working on me. And, you know, one day, one day I'm going to get there. See how your balloon just sort of like, whoop, right out, right out away from their hot poker. It just gets out of the way. And it actually, it can, it can make someone even more angry uh, because they want you to respond how they feel inside. But you're up in the air with your mind set on the things of Christ, set on the location of Christ. You're closing your eyes if you have to, and you are sitting right next to the Lord Jesus. Now some dum-dums trying to come and tear you, tear you out of that place where Jesus Christ has seated you. And actually, if you respond with meekness, if you respond with patience, if you respond with bearing with one another, and this actually means just like putting up with someone, just putting up with them, like not doing anything special, just going, eh. They cannot tear you out of that high, high place that Christ has seated you. Right? Actually, if your mind is on the things of God, if you are always with Jesus, 
and somebody's coming around trying to pop your balloons, here are very easy ways that you can respond. Write these down. Use them this week. You will need them. Someone's going to be pushing your buttons. Select off of the menu of responses. And because you're going to forget it in the, mo in the moment, you're going to have this in your back pocket, you're going to put it out and pull it out and you're going to say to yourself, how do I have a compassionate heart for this person? I want to respond that way. God help me respond that way. And then just try. How do I respond in kindness? How do I respond in humility? How do I respond in meekness, in patience? How do I put up with this person? Lord Jesus, help me put up with this person. And if you have a complaint against them, forgive them. Forgive each other. You have that option too. You, you, maybe you're done putting up with them. I'm done putting up with you. I choose to forgive you. Why? Because that's the way Jesus treats you. So, if you've been a Christian for a while, just start treating other people the way that Jesus treats you. Right? Aren't we kind of dumb-dumbs to Jesus? Doesn't he say, hey, you should do this? I go, no, I'm going to do it my way. Yes, we do. And how does Jesus respond? I'm afraid you won't like it. You know, that sin's going to give you a bellyache. You know, you're going you're gonna to hurt yourself. But I love you, and, and, and I'm still working on you. I'm not going anywhere. In the end, Christians, we have a word for this. It's here in verse 14. And above all these, put on love. I love that, because he uses the word above, which obviously he means more than all of these. But because I'm preaching about going up, it just works, you know? Above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body. And be thankful. There's a nice, this is how a train works. That word and is a conjunction and it links uh, cars on the train together. Love. And peace. And be thankful. Those three things. Love and peace and thankfulness. This is what you might call like an immediate altitude boost. If you feel like you're, you're coming down. We don't want our spiritual life to be dictated by our circumstances. That's not maturity. It's, it's, all, it's okay to be there for a season when you're an immature believer. The Lord will teach you. He'll, he'll, he'll help you. But if we want to be serious about our faith, we, we have to, when we feel ourselves dropping down, oh, I need to put my mind back on the things of Christ and love and peace and thankfulness are always, always recovery, altitude recovery instantaneously. I mean, try it this week. This week, you will find a time where you are like, oh, I feel far from God. Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm really frustrated. I'm really angry. Try a little thankfulness. And it's amazing what happens. It works. So let me close this out by reading the last couple of verses here. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is what it looks like when a bunch of people get together and they're all floating together. They, they, they are all up above the circumstances of the world. They, they leave 
what's going on, practically speaking, in my life, and now I just get to be who God's called me to be, which is seated with him, already dead, already resurrected, totally, my well-being is totally disconnected from the things going on in my life. It just is. It's a powerful gift that God has given to me. He's given it to all of us. And when we get together, you might see that a few people around the room are dragging anchor a little bit. They're trying to get up. They want to get up, but they're attached to something. How does the church respond to that? Well, we teach and admonish. Admonish means like warning, like, like, like exhortation, in, but, but especially in telling someone, hey, you should be cautious of this one thing, which makes it sound immediately like, oh, my goodness. I'm not sure I want to be around a bunch of happy people who admonish me um, when we get together. Um, but Paul tells them how. He doesn't say, hey, you see someone who's kind of unhappy? Why don't you stick your nose in their business and tell them why they should be happy? He doesn't say that. He says, yes, you should teach one another. Yes, you should admonish one another. But it's in corporate worship. That's how Paul says we can admonish one another and teach one another with singing. What an incredible weapon. And of course, the world has this weapon too. That's why whenever the world is singing their worship songs, it's about immorality. It's about getting high. It's about killing people. It's about all of the other things that they wish they could do, but they're illegal. When Christians sing songs, we sing, worthy, he is worthy. We sing, the love of God. We sing about how our God is a mighty fortress. We think, we sing and think about the things that are above. And it is how we encourage one another. And, verse 17, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And so, if I can just give out uh, sort of the final, the final little gift that Paul's giving us this morning, that whatever we do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. What, what would your life and my life look like if we were actually able to do that? Well, I don't know, because I'm not there. But I know it'd be great, and I know that Paul's not saying one day when you get really good at being a Christian, you can. He's saying, no, 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 right now, right here. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, things you say, things you do, everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means that the people who are in your life right now are people that you can treat this way. They don't even have to become better people before we can start treating them in, in everything that we say and everything that we do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So, when we are doing the things that Paul is asking the church to do here, it will be with our minds on the things of God. All the time, our minds on the things of God. Putting off the things of the flesh, putting on the actions and the, the requirements of Jesus. And then, then, when the world encounters the church, the witness is undeniable. These people act like they've already died and they're already resurrected. They act like the circumstances of their life don't dictate how good they're doing or bad they're doing. I want that. And so we can be a witness if we'll put our minds on the things of the Lord and in all that we do, 
in word or in deed, if we do it in the name of the Lord Jesus and give thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Lord God, what an incredible, what an incredible truth. Help us this week to put our minds on you and on your things. And God, we've got a lot going on. And it seems like disasters and potential disasters are piling up on every street corner, in, in, in every place here in America in our day. It seems like there's emergency after emergency and things are probably only going to get worse. But we know, Lord God, that through you, because you've chosen us, because you love us, because you have made us holy, we have already died and we are already resurrected, living with you. Spirit of God, help us to actually live there with our minds on your things. Help us to not be trapped by the circumstances of our life, but to be set free. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the King of Kings, who is the Alpha and the Omega, who has come and is coming again. Lord, we love you. Amen.